I'm very happy to have Paul Elam as my guest in this segment. Paul is a is one of many spokespeople for the men's rights movement, men's rights advocates, and uh, it's been a controversial organi- a controversial movement uh, because it's been called anti-feminist and uh, and lots of other names, but. Um, we're going to avoid name calling here and really find out what are the real issues uh, that that men are upset about in in response to feminism and to the, uh, the some of the laws that have been passed that have, have actually uh, hurt men in the same way that uh, women responded to being hurt by men. Men are responding to being hurt by women. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting half hour. Paul, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. I'll tell you a little bit about Paul. Uh, Paul is a writer, a videographer, a counselor, uh, and an activist. And uh, he de- he describes what he has as a love affair with justice. And uh, he's answered a personal call to help others. Uh, what he what is called the invisibility of men's suffering. And uh, he found inspiration in the works of Warren Farrell, who we had on the program earlier and other writers on, on the world of men's pain. And he founded a voiceformen.com, where he's written over 300 articles dealing with the struggles of men in Western culture. And he also hosts a radio show on Blog Talk Radio called A Voice for Men. And, uh, and uh, let's see, you have a, a, an interesting background, Paul. You were in the military, uh, as your father was, uh, and... Uh, you escaped to college, as you said, and uh, you, you, wrote yes, in your bi- you wrote in your bio, after a few attempts at majoring in beer, <laughs> I settled on psychology and uh, minored in uh, bothering the, uh, the faculty. So <laughs> I appreciated that. Um, and I did better at my minor than I did my major. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and then you went into uh, uh, drug, count- drug and alcohol counseling and, and did that career for 20 years, is my understanding. Is that right? That's right. So uh, while you were there, this was at the, the sort of the peaking of the feminist movement. Why don't you tell the story about what you saw from from inside on the front lines of dealing with people with with addictions, uh, and and how how you saw it affecting uh, your whole practice? Well, what I saw initially was a greater awareness of women's issues, of some of the abuses that occurred in their lives. Um, you know, we tie a lot of chemical abuse, chemical dependency with people into history of abuse in their childhood, even in adulthood, uh, post-traumatic stress-related stuff. And what we saw in beginning to work and understand, work with and understand special populations was that women had needs that were somewhat different than men's. They had experiences that were different. And we began to mold treatment modalities and programs to accommodate for that knowledge and to address those issues. Uh, It was a good thing. I was totally behind it, was very actively involved with it for some time. What happened as time passed, though, was not just the advocacy for women, which we needed to do at that time, but it became something different. Political ideologues became involved, and there began slowly messages of men being at the root of all these problems, that it wasn't... uh, abusive mothers that we focused on, which happens so frequently, but it was abusive fathers. It wasn't uh, anybody but men. We, we sort of developed a language that addressed every problem that women brought into treatment settings and began to refer those problems in some way or another back to an origin in their relationship with men in their lives. Sometimes that was accurate. Sometimes it was not. But as time went by, even that became more bitter, uh, more angry as time went by. And we started seeing outright persecution of men. We would bring men into groups and lecture them uh, about what louts they were. I didn't do that personally, but that happened. And as far as I know, it still happens today. Uh, We stopped treating chemical addiction or chemical dependency in men and started treating them for being masculine as though it were a pathology. It became very abusive and it soured all the good work that we were trying to do. And that's what, uh, to sum it up, that's what happened. 
know, when you when you say uh, being treated for masculinity as a pathology, I mean, it's, it's, those are strong words, and and yet, um, are you talking about the um, just the, the purely masculine being big and strong and directive, or are you talking about the more uh, uh, the tendency toward anger, violence, and, and hurting others, or domination and control? There's so many aspects. Which ones were being targeted? Well, or were, the, were, the, were they all put in the same basket? Well, that I would identify actually as part of the problem. Violence is not an inherently masculine trait. There are plenty of violent women in this world, plenty of them. Uh, all the research out there supports that. The idea that violence itself is innately masculine is erroneous to begin with. Um, what we needed to do was address, certainly address violence in homes. I mean, we had, in dealing with alcoholics and addicts, I dealt with a lot of families where children have been abused by parents of both sexes. Uh, I didn't see one greater than the other, except perhaps with the, uh, the incidence of child abuse, physical child abuse. It tended to be more female than male. Now, uh, it, if I had taken that proposition, that reality, and turned it into some sort of idea that there was an innate violence in femininity, that we needed to address as, say, one aspect of, of being female, it would have been considered sexism, and it would have been sexism. It would have been absolutely wrong, because the problem wasn't being female. Uh, the problem was being, not being in control. And so my, while my experience said that violent behavior in families didn't have a sex, the ideologues that were practicing treatment were furthering the idea that it did have a sex, and they were doing so quite dishonestly and for political reasons. And so the, the, you and the men's rights movement uh, have been working hard to bring uh, the facts to bear on this problem. And, and over the last 20 years, as, uh, as this, this feminist, uh, well, it's hard for me to call it an ideology, but, but I'll use your term, uh, you've been you've been giving counter arguments and counter facts to show that, for example, uh, one third of, of all abused children are male. That it's not all females being abused, and that women uh, start fights, and uh, and although they get hurt more often because they're smaller, uh, a, a large percentage of of fights between men and women are started by the women. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to balance the books here, right? I mean, you're trying to say. It's not a strictly male or female issue. Well, well absolutely, and if you'll uh, indulge me for just a moment, just to allow me the correction, uh, many, many more than one-third of abused children are, are male. Um, it's a minimum of one-third of the victims of domestic violence are male, uh, depending on which studies you look at, but most yep. of them reflect sort of a gender symmetry in that. But most of the abuses that happen to children happen to male children, not to female. Ah, good. Thank you. I was I was quoting the wrong study that I had read. So, sure. um, so so this is really important that that uh, the the mythology out there, or let's say the the general mythology, is that women have been the victims of abuse. Women have been the victims of violence, and. Um, as Warren Farrell points out, men have been on the front lines and been used as cannon fodder and been used as production objects uh, in the same way that women have been used as, as sex objects. So what, what I'm getting from what you're saying is that both sexes are equally victims, both sexes are equally perpetrators, and what we've got to do is get past all of that. We have to get past the idea that, that violence is about sex. Um, we have to get the, uh, past the idea that probably any identifiable social malady out there is about sex at all. Uh, all the valid research indicates that that just isn't so, and that's why we tend to refer to feminism as an ideology, uh, is because it flies in the face of reality. Uh, it paints the patriarchal picture, which is all of feminism is predicated on, on patriarchy theory, and how domestic violence is just an extension of men's control in the world into the home and how women are victims of that. But the actual research, the exhaustive research on all of this points to the fact of gender symmetry where it concerns violence. And it ideologues are the people that ignore all that and march forward 
with doing things like creating a Violence Against Women Act instead of a Violence in the Family Act. And so um, uh, you, you are just one spokesperson among many in, in the men's rights Correct. movement, but what are some of the political actions you're taking or have taken to, to balance these books? We don't take political action at A Voice for Men. Uh, that is, we leave up to the politicians. We do have occasional letter writing campaigns. Um, we do to, I have written many, many letters myself to politicians, but that is the extent of our political action. Uh, we see this problem more of one of perception, uh, of a social problem, that misandry or the the hatred of men and boys, the contempt for them or the invisibility of their pain, if you will, is a problem rooted in our human psychology. And what we try to do is educate people and let them know that what they've been told for 50 years by feminists, that much of it, almost all of it, is not true, that men are not the evil brigands painted in society, that, the, that they have been painted to be in society, that men for the most part have spent their lives in sacrifice for their families, for women, for, for their cultures. They have been cannon fodder. They were, they're 93% of all workplace deaths. They're the people out there doing what needs to be done at the risk of their lives to further society and to take care of their families. But we've somehow managed to develop this picture through ideologues that uh, there's been a 5,500-year reign of terror on women from men. It simply isn't so. A Voice for Men is about saying that as loudly and clearly as possible until people listen. And that's what we intend to do. Well, I, I interviewed Rian Eisler, uh, who is considered... Uh, a, a strong feminist, but but in my conversation with her, she she didn't say we had a 5,500 year uh, domination by men. She said we had a 5,500 year history of domination as a paradigm, rather than partnership uh, as a paradigm, and and that domination has been from the top down, the hierarchies of of the power structure, and and it has impacted men and women. It has impacted both sexes equally and badly. Um, and uh, she's she's recommending coming back into partnership. Is that is that something that you would align with, or or do you think it has to be different? Absolutely, than a I would I would align with anything that's that's based in reality. But I don't think that we can say we're being real as long as we ignore uh, ignore 50 years of feminist doctrine, 50 years of feminist writing, 50 years of feminist ideology that has instructed the culture that the domination and oppression has been by men at the expense of women and that that is how the model has worked. Now, we're on board with anybody and totally and completely in agreement with looking at perhaps the in, in the hierarchy of power in the world, it is the upper 0.5% that have dominated everybody else. And I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, they happen to be mostly men, but when we talk about the lives of men in general, 99.9% .9 of them live powerless lives where they're used for fodder, where they're expendable, where they're viewed in a utilitarian way in our culture. And until we start acknowledging that, then common ground is going to be hard to find because we have to start being able to have an honest dialogue with each other about what has really gone on in our history. And the picture painted by feminism, the one most commonly accepted in the culture, is not, in my opinion, the right message. It's a dishonest one. So, you know, Warren, Warren Farrell called us the disposable sex. Uh, which Absolutely. I was, which I thought was good. And, and uh, what you're saying is that most men, the, the, the vast majority, if not the, the, the 90 percent or more are, are men who are really doing the best they can trying to live a life in which they can provide for their family for which they can i mean we're all socialized right to be certain kinds of men and that's some of the things we're we've been talking about in this program is that we're, we're conditioned to be a certain way which makes which but uh, everyone's talking about how can we uncondition ourselves how can we come become more full and whole human beings 
Well, uh, and I think that that is probably the most noble pursuit I can think of on behalf of men and women. Unfortunately, we run into some very sticky ground. Uh, what I think that most people in the, in the men's rights movement would tell you is that if we want to start making those kind of changes toward a better end for all of culture, one of the first things that has to go is any notion of chivalry, any notion of male expendability, of disposability, of our being cannon fodder or being seen uh, in utilitarian terms. Uh, Warren had uh, a great term from his book, The Myth of Male Power, or he talks about women being viewed as sex objects. And then he gave the absolute perfect retort to say that men are viewed as success objects. Objects. That is part of the problem I think we're going to have to address when we do to the idea of getting everybody on an even playing field, so to speak. I don't think that really exists in, in the real world, but to try to search for that ideal one of the things that men need to start looking at is to quit telling each other to man up, to be a real man, to do the right thing for women, and start looking at the injustices that are happening to men in this culture right now in the family courts, you know, with the epidemic of false accusations we have against men, all the other real problems that men are facing. We need to quit telling each other how to be better good men and start encouraging each other to speak up about our real problems and to actually do something about them. How about both? Would that be okay with you? If, if, we, well, if we become better men and we speak up about inju all kinds of injustices? I think we become better men by speaking up about these injustices, not by telling each other to be better providers. Men are already providers. They're already good men in this world. Sure, we've got our problems like everybody else, but if we really want to accomplish both missions, I think we have to start not by doing both, and you're doing both by doing the one, by speaking up about these problems, by asking the world to start looking at men's pain as though it's real, as though, hey, if you peel back my skin, there's not wires and gears here. There's flesh and blood. When I'm accused of rape or when I'm divorced and the, and, the, and the court takes my home and my children away from me, I bleed inside because of that. I don't just go perform my job. We have a five-to-one rate of male suicide in this country. Um, it has grown tremendously since the advent of gender feminism in the 60s and with all these, these rules of feminist governance that we're now living with in our courts. So the courts, have, the courts have passed laws to protect women, but they did not equally protect men. Um, I know that in California, uh, someone worked very hard to give men equal, equal uh, parenting uh, as, as a standard, but that's not true around the country, right? Oh, oh it's, it's, not, it's never been. It's, it, it is so far askewed that it's ridiculous, and now we have organizations, so-called men's organizations out there, and I'm not going to name them for the sake of, of respecting the individuals at your conference that are out there right now working to block access, one, of domestic violence services to men, and two, characterizing men who want more time with their children, fathers' rights activists, as an abuser's lobby whose only reason for seeking more time for their, with their children is to abuse them. That is an absolute abomination, and it needs to end. And we need to start confronting this stuff in other men, not encouraging them to speak for us, because they don't speak for men in general. They're speaking for themselves from an ideological point of view. I also understand uh, from some of the writings on your website that um, the National Organization of Women is lobbying against uh, a, a father's equal rights amendment or something in the courts. Could you say what that is? I'm, I'm not clear. You know, I really can't speak to that intelligently. I don't follow now um, uh, very much. They have become less relevant uh, over the uh, as feminism has settled into sort of a default setting for our culture. The active political organizations for women like now aren't quite as relevant. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. They've been working against any issue that might bring more parity for men since their inception. 
And they're, of course, primary among the people that are furthering the idea that men are the bad guys and that they, we, we simply owe women some sort of, I don't know, you know collective apology uh, for having been men in the first place. So I, I'd like to, but I can't speak intelligently to that particular issue. Okay, well, I think, I think uh, we've had a couple of people on our program that have said that uh, the re research shows that when children are raised by both parents, even in a divorce situation, when they have equal custody, uh, they actually show greater intelligence and a lot fewer social problems. So I think that's the that's the basis oh, absolutely. upon which you're, you're certainly um, when when children have access, and I don't mean visitation from Uncle Daddy once a weekend, but I mean regular influence from their fathers in their lives. They do much better on every level of psychosocial functioning that we measure. Uh, whether it's performance in school, uh, truancy, drug use, teen pregnancy, all these things. It is the father's involvement in their lives that prevents those things from happening. When you go out and look on the streets right now and all these gangs that are out there, 95% of them fatherless homes or more. Um, it's a horrendous problem. We're falling apart because of it. And instead of addressing the fact that courts are regularly eviscerating men's rights and taking them away from their children, we have a president who steps up to the podium and says men just need to step up uh, and be better fathers. Well, they have to be allowed access to their children in order to do that. That's an important uh, important part of, of our culture. And, um, you know, you could say that it's because of the divorce rate, that, uh, but, but really you're talking about divorce courts that that they tend to give custody toward the mother instead of equal to both parents. Well, sure. It's, well, it's not only that, but you look at the divorce rate. Uh, it's skyrocketed since the advent of no-fault divorce, which is essentially marriage as a contract. And feminist ideologues, again, infiltrate the political system, get laws passed that say, well, you don't even have to have a good reason to, to get a divorce. You can... Take the house, the kids, the car, the property, the money, well, because it's Tuesday. And we were shocked that since then the divorce rate has skyrocketed and fatherlessness has skyrocketed, uh, gangs have skyrocketed. We have all these social ills that are a result of that simply because we wanted to, you, and, and they use the excuse, well, some women are financially trapped in, in terrible marriages, abusive marriages, and we need to give them an out. Um, it, but rather than saying, well, we need to demonstrate where the abuse is and, and provide legal remedies for those women on that level, we just say anyone who wants a divorce, that we'll just make the primary breadwinner the financial target of the court. The other person can take half of it and go, and that's almost always the mother. We've, we've had a really wide range of uh, conversations on, on our program over these many days, and uh, it's clear that there are differences between men and women. There's differences between masculinity and femininity. Uh, there's differences between the conditioning that we get as boys and girls, and, uh, and there's differences in how we approach every subject. Uh, even uh, Alison Armstrong was talking about how, how our attention is different, women's attention is different than men's. And uh, you know, we're trying to live together almost as two species and, uh, and, and work together. Uh, what can we do as men, uh, regardless of what women are doing, what can we do as men to expand our own uh, awareness and ability to, to be in good relationships? To be in good relationships with, 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 with women? With women and, and also with each other. Well, you know, I don't. Think I can I can speak intelligently to that question. I think what men should be doing, if I can use a should, I don't like to. Go uh, right ahead. But what I would encourage men to do is to start considering the relationships with each other. That we look at how we relate to each other as men. That we look at at whether or not that we turn away from each other's pain, each other's tragedies in life, each other's abuses in life. Um, in terms of how we relate to women, uh, I, I think there's, there's some growing pains to be had here, quite honestly. 
We have set up a culture that has enabled uh, just terrible abuses of men and justified it. And we have, unfortunately, trained women. And, and, and I'm not faulting women for this. Our culture, but our culture has trained them to expect to be able to wield those abuses on men at will uh, for whatever reason they imagine that they want to. What we need to do if we want to improve relationships with women is to ask them to be held to account and to hold themselves accountable for how they view men in utilitarian terms, for how they view men in legal terms, in financial terms, and to hold ourselves accountable for setting those kind of boundaries with women and to, to try to help them understand that it's not a measure of love or respect for them but that things between the sexes have gotten flat out of hand and that we as human beings need to all step up to the plate and take a more honest look at things and say, look, we're going to have to start with mutual respect, real mutual respect, past my wallet, past your body, overlooking all that stuff, respecting each other as human beings and moving forward. And right now we live in a culture that doesn't respect men, and we have to address that if we're ever going to get anywhere. Good. So I want to. I think that's an excellent recommendation, and I, and I want to move to uh, the, the topic of tactics uh, because uh, as I've explored the men's rights activist movement, um, I've been kind of shocked actually by by the attitude of some people, um, which is to me. Um, Gosh, what can I say? It, it's uh, there's a lot of blaming, name calling, generalizing, uh, a, a lot of promotion of a, of a war against feminism. It, it's it's kind of it feels like it's the same domination pattern, only now it's reversed and the target is now feminism. Um, and and as we've had on our Facebook forum, um, I welcome reason dialogue. I welcome civil conversation. I welcome. Uh, you know, uh, facts and, and studies, uh, and, and I think educating each other is really important. But why are there so many men out there that are that, that haven't like taken their anger and channeled it into something productive? Well, w with all respect, Lion, that that's sort of like going to a, a leper colony and being shocked at all the scars on people's faces. We have had a culture that for 50 years has been doing the name calling calling men pigs, calling men violent, calling men everything under the sun, blaming them for everything, using those, those names and those labels as excuses to steal their property, their children, and their freedom. And we're going to be shocked that, that some of them are angry enough to express themselves in ways that we wouldn't normally think of in, in polite company. I'm sorry, but I, I, I really have to, to challenge that. We must start looking past some of the, the understandable boilovers that are coming out of men in this culture and start looking at the hurt that is underneath it, the absolute devastation. I, you know, I haven't had even some of the experience of some of these guys. I've had, uh, I get emails all the time, all the time, from men who have lost their freedom, who have been in prison, who have had their children whom they love more than their own life, just totally ripped away from them by caprice. And when they try to speak up about saying, hey, this is wrong, men tell them to shut up and man up, women tell them they have it coming, and the courts say, you know, just pretty much tell them where to go. These are voices of men who have been voices. That's why I called this a voice for men, because there isn't one. There is no voice in this culture for, for men who are hurt and wounded, and we should not be judging them. And I'll use the should here, Lion. We should not be judging those men. We should be trying to acknowledge their pain. We might try to acknowledge them, and, and, and I'm sure should, to find more productive ways to express it. And I do that all the time. I'm always asking some of these really, really angry guys to think about whether or not this is effective or helping them because I'd like to see them move on to more productive places. But I, I, I do not accept any shock or outrage or indignation at the fact that if you put somebody in a corner long enough and beat on them, they're going to start swinging back. That's human nature, not male nature. 
Uh, I think we really need to, that is exactly what, for me, this whole conversation is about, is about saying, hey, wait a minute, why Why do you think they're that way? Do you think that they just woke up and said, I want to scream at feminism or scream at women? No, they're not like that. These are guys that are pulling, still pulling knives out of their backs, and the world is laughing at them as they bleed. So as long as that's happening, they're going to get louder and louder. Well, and I think the, the, the men's the, rights movement is trying to do something about that. Good. Well, I mean, that's why we're having you here because we're not laughing at anyone. We know that there's real. Pain. I hear you. Yeah, there's real pain out there on both sides of of the aisle, on the masculine feminine aisle. And uh, <clears throat> you know, what I what I notice is that you know when you look back at the 50 years of feminism, women got together, they they lobbied, they they uh, went to Congress, they worked on laws, they. You know, they they took their pain uh, and and they channeled it into what they thought was more fair. Now it's gone too far. The pendulum has swung too far, and now men are being hurt. So to me, it, it seems uh, let let's get men to to go out there and lobby. Let's create uh, you know 500 centers for for men. Uh, and how do we? What's the best way to reach men? Uh, that have been hurt and, and organize them. You know, let's don't don't complain. Organize. <laughs> okay. Well, no. You you you. Ha- I'm going to say it again. Complain, guys. Complain, guys. Listen to this. Complain and complain more. And when they tell you not to complain, complain some more. What you have to understand, line, is at the beginning when the women's movement happened uh, in full earnest in the '60s in this country, that they were already in a system that cared about their pain that cared about their struggles. They had great acceptance. They had a little resistance, but it, they went from 1960s gender feminism to 50 years later and accre- uh, accomplished astounding things because we already live in a culture that is wired to hear women's struggles and for men to jump and do something about it. We have just the opposite for men. There have been men out here for 40 years, believe it or not, that have been trying to sort of shout out into the wilderness about what's going on with men, and they are called woman haters and homophobes and every other name you can think of by feminist ideologues. Politicians ignore them because they're, they're, they know that women will vote collectively against them if they speak out. Um, we live in a very different world for men when it comes to speaking about now, if I wanted to organize and, and fight for somebody else's pain, if I wanted to fight for children, or if I wanted to fight for women or minority rights, then the world would be very accepting of that. But the moment that I step up and say that we need to address these terrible things that are happening to men, the world will automatically turn around because of men's disposability and try to shut me down. I've been dealing with that for 25 years. Oh, well, that's so, why that's why we've had you here. Um, Paul, there's a number of questions uh, that have come in over the webcast, and uh, we're, we're actually past our time, but I want to go further because this is so important. Um, Thank you. So, so let me um, first ask, uh, Paul, Paul's, Paul can be reached through his website, avoiceformen.com, or, and you can also go on to uh, um, Blog Talk Radio and search for his program. Uh, I do want to warn you that, that from my perspective as a uh, sensitive New Age guy, it is, uh, there's, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of yelling <laughs> going on, so uh, be forewarned. Uh, but his, uh, his website is uh, voiceformen.com. And um, let's just go look at some of this. If you, uh, Paul, do you want people's email addresses in case, uh, so you can be in touch with them? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so if you would like to uh, be on Paul's mailing list, press 1 now if you're on the Maestro Conference. And if you're on the webcast, you can put your email address into the message node there and send it, send that. We'll gather those and hand them to Paul. Um, and so let's uh, first go to the webcast questions. Uh, there's a number of them here. Um, the, uh, David asks, what about the third world? Wouldn't empowering women make a huge difference? And I think that comes from the fact that when uh, loans are made to women, the whole culture improves. When loans are made to men, uh, they tend to drink more <laughs> so, and that kind of thing. Um, aren't sexist attitudes oh, – let's see, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading this. Um, aren't sexist attitudes a cause of a lot of the violence? Okay, so do you want to respond to any of that? 
Well, yeah, by saying one, it's hard to take that question seriously, the, the sexism that is just absolutely dripping from it. Uh, but this does serve a very illustrative point. I just got through, and, and we got through talking for 30 minutes about some very, very serious problems faced by men in this culture. Um, I don't think anybody would argue that a, uh, a five-to-one suicide rate or um, that the family courts or that the level of male depression, unemployment, uh, false accusations, all these are very serious problems. And the first response that I got was somebody saying about, what about women in the third world? Well, you know, there are struggles over there, and I certainly acknowledge that and understand it, and I certainly don't have <laughs> any objection to anybody helping those women in the third world. But if you want to tell me that we need to uh, give money to women in the third world because if you give it to men, they'll just drink, you know, if the, if the, if the sexual tone was reversed in this, uh, and I had made that kind of a statement about women, everybody would be outraged at it. And I'm personally outraged, whoever you are, sir, that, or ma'am, that asked that question, that is sexist, it is bigoted, and I don't appreciate it at all, and I cannot take you seriously as somebody interested in finding solutions between men and women in this culture as long as you're presenting such a bigoted mentality. Okay, well, I'm ready for the next one. That's ready to go on. Okay. Um, uh, someone without a name uh, asked the question, what are the statistics on rape and sexual assault? So you have, I know you have carry statistics around in your head, but uh, what are the male to female and female to male? Uh, well, rape is, is predominantly, in terms of victim, a, a male problem in this culture. We have somewhere in the neighborhood from the United Nations statistics around 240, 245,000 uh, sexual assaults or attempted sexual assaults of women in this, in this country alone, in America. Uh, if we start actually looking at men, uh, rape in prison, well over 300,000 per year, estimated. Uh, female rape of men happens quite a bit. Sexual abuses of men, in, of juvenile men in custody facilities from female guardians happens with some regularity. There is quite the epidemic of female school teachers who are committing statutory rape against male students. So we do have uh, a significant problem in perception there, too. Uh, rape is a serious crime. Uh, it should carry serious consequences. Nobody's certainly arguing about that. But we have, instead of looking at the overall picture, the reality of rape, how much of it happens. And by the way, rape in prison culture is encouraged by people who run prisons as a way to manage them. It's all part of the uh, how you sort of uh, keep control of things within a prison. Uh, so they tolerate it, ignore it, look the other way when it happens. But what we have instead of an awareness of the problems that both men and women experience from sexual violence and culture is that we immediately remove men from the equation as victims. They just simply, just like with domestic violence, they don't happen. Right. They're not a part of our mentality. So now we have slut walks going across the world, all focused on women's rape. And again, for the same reason, we enable and encourage that because men's pain is invisible. And the minute you start talking about, well, let's take a look at what happen what's happening in prison. This is something that needs to be addressed seriously, and we don't even talk about it. So... Men in prison aren't, 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 aren't men in prison aren't really able to go out and do a walk, are they? To to bring attention no, to it, they're they're sort of disposed of and ignored, and and uh, with with our with our uh, belief that that men should be punished for their crimes instead of rehabilitated, uh, they they kind of get left out. Uh, absolutely, uh, and for and punished for their alleged crimes too, because we find out from the Innocence Project. Uh, most of the people that they, the men that they get released release from prison are there from rape, for rape, almost all of them. And we find that the level of police misconduct, prosecut prosecutorial misconduct, and false accusation has a huge impact on that. Um, it's a horrible, horrible problem with men being raped, many of them in prison innocently being raped, ironically enough, as a part of their lifestyle there. And when somebody asks you a question about statistics on rape, 
almost any time, unless it's an MRA, a men's rights advocate, asking that question, they're only thinking about women in their mind. Tell us about what's happening to women. We only no? have about we only about have about five minutes left. So okay. so let's just see if we, how many points we can get. Uh, Jamie writes, "This is a great interview. It's real and it talks about men's pain." It would be great to have just joy, myself included, but it, but it's not the case. If we can express our pain, I think we will feel. Sorry, it's moving. I think we will feel so much more connected and free with other men. Comment um, probably doesn't need to be responded to. Um, no, good statement. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and an, another comment uh, among the primary problems I see among men, men's groups notwithstanding is their inability to talk with one another. I think the entire U.S. Congress should all meet for a weekend and do a Mankind Project initiation weekend. There's a good idea. Uh, maybe after that experience we'd see... Um, uh, sorry. Uh, maybe we'd see uh, some love expressed between each other instead of what we have now, divisive behavior toward one another. Please comment. Oh. Well, I, I agree with that comment. I agree entirely with it. I, there is... You know, I certainly would not assert that men don't have things they can learn from women. They do. Uh, women are much better survivors than men. They connect socially much better than men. I think that's one of the reasons why they're, they're so much more successful at activism than men are, because men get into hierarchical competition with each other with, wherever they are. It's, it's our genetic nature, if you will. And it's one of the things that we have to combat we don't have to, however, combat that by becoming feminized ourselves. Uh, this is a time for men to learn to adapt. There is no doubt, as your summit points out, I think, quite fairly, things have changed in the world. You know, we may not agree, all of us agree on exactly how they've changed or what those changes should be, but there's no doubt that things have changed drastically in the past 50 years in the world of men. And so far, men are not, I don't think, adjusting to that very well. I think one of the things that would be very helpful is, just like this caller, this, this person pointed out, uh, for men to begin to learn to talk to each other in ways that are non-competitive, that we share ideas, that we share culture and society with each other in ways that build our strength and build our unity so that we can accomplish not only more activism and, and correcting all these injustices, but address some of the other problems that we might have between each other, uh, between each other as men. I, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I think it's a real challenge because men are so geared. By the way, all the, the competition you see, that is ultimately about women and about competing for them, which we won't have time to get to today. But who knows? At another conference, I'd love to talk about that. Good. Well, well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, let me just give the audience a little bit of preview of upcoming attractions at 11 o'clock. I'll be interviewing Mark Schillinger, the founder of Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, a program for young men ages 14 through 20 to initiate them into young manhood, a fabulous program that I've participated in, and it's a, a rite of passage that uh, Sequoia Trueblood was talking about, how much is needed, especially by young men. And uh, my co-host, Stephen Dynan, at 12 o'clock, will be talking to Craig Neal, founder of Heartland, a, a wonderful organization, and uh, a men's wilderness leader about deepening your vision through journeys into wilderness. And uh, coming up at 12.45, Michael Kimmel, uh, a writer on men and masculinity. And I think, Paul, you, some, some of your cohorts have some pretty strong opinions about Michael and, and what he represents. Uh, not just my cohorts. That would include me. Okay, good. So uh, uh, we, we'll, we'll hold, hold that for a moment. But he's going to be talking about neither Mars nor Venus. We're all Earthlings. So, uh, And then uh, 130, Robert White, another good friend of mine, the founder of LifeSpring, uh, talking about, surprise, your identity isn't you. And there's lots more programming to come. So, Paul, I, I want to first, uh, before we close here, uh, thank you very much for appearing here and being so articulate about the, the real pain that men are suffering uh, and the, the, what needs to happen in order to, to recognize the, the similarity between the suffering of women and the suffering of men. So really appreciate it. Let me opinion. return the compliment line. Uh, you have held up, I think, remarkably well under uh, what I think is understandable pressure that was sent your way. 
but I know that it was a challenge, and I think you conducted yourself very professionally, and uh, I'm left with uh, a lot of respect for what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate that. So uh, Paul's website, avoiceformen.com. And, Paul, would you like to uh, stay and, and speak to people uh, directly in a small group? We can put you into a group with people. Sure. That will be Great. fine. Uh, so if you would like to uh, be in a small group setting with Paul, uh, you can press 1 on your phone now. If you'd like to be in groups uh, by yourselves, uh, you can press 2 now, and we'll put you into groups of 4, uh, and uh, you can talk about these issues with each other. Um, once you hear the bell ring, you can just self-manage, and uh, uh, we'll ask if you're in with Paul to please keep as quiet as you can, and Paul and just one person speak at a time uh, by saying your name first, and then Paul will call on you so that we can keep that uh, that conversation moderated, and uh, um, we'll have about about uh, 13 minutes before the next program starts, so uh, press 1 now if you'd like to be in a conversation with Paul, and press 2 if you'd like to be in a conversation with others, and uh, thank you all well, for will I need to press? Would I need to press 1 also? Uh, we'll, we'll put you automatically in that group. Okay. It looks like it's going to be a very large group, so uh, let's see, Deborah, can you... Can you be in that group and manage the conversation? Deborah is our technology master for the day. Wonderful. Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll try to ma help you manage that conversation so it's not a, a, a huge uproar, but there's a lot of people that want to speak to you. So again, thank you all for being here for this conversation with Paul and for the Ultimate Men's Summit, and we look forward to having you on the next program or whenever you rejoin us. Thanks very much, everybody. When the bell rings, uh, you'll be in, in a room with Paul uh, or you'll be in a small group with each other. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lionel. Bye now.